Hello again, everybody, and welcome to Choices Finding Your Joy. Paula Vale here, and we are going to find some joy today, as well as inspiration and education. I am so happy to share with everyone Steve Hassenberg. He is a spiritual psycho therapist, an artist, writer, and a lifelong meditator. Over the last 35 years, he has been studying the sacred teachings of many cultures and integrating and integrating them into the fabric of Western psychology. And as Steve does so much, as well as being an author, and he does webinars, he has podcasts, but we're going to talk about all that with Steve. First off, welcome, Steve. Good to be here, Paula. Thank you. It's so nice to see your smiling face. Uh, so happy. Yes, I'm sending hugs your way, Steve. Good. <laughs> That's what I do. I'm, I'm a hugger. I love that. I'll take them. Oh, well, I, I would love, you have such an amazing background. I would love to have you share a bit about that with everyone, please. Of course. Where would you like me to start, before birth or after birth? <laughs> you choose. <laughs> <laughs> well, we talked before the radio show a bit, and uh, you wanted to know how my spiritual path began. And um, many nights when I was 10, 11, and 12, I would be up at night, and I'm sure this is true for a lot of the listeners, I would be up at night wondering where I would go if I died. Mm -hmm. I'd wonder where I came from, and I'd wonder why I was here. And that was so strong for me. If it wasn't nightly, it was weekly, and it just went on and on. And then when I was 12, I was at a YMCA camp in northern New Jersey, and it was twilight, and I was involved with a baseball game, and I was waiting my turn at bat. And as I waited, I flew out of my body, and I wound up in a tree in the right field, looking and observing the game. And I didn't have any fear. I should have had fear, but I had no fear. In fact, I had a state of empty, was like an empty awareness, non-judgmental, non-thought-provoking, a kind of harmonious experience. And I wondered how it happened, but then I shot back into my body. And I was waiting, I thought I had gone mad how boys think about it at 12. I must be going crazy. Yeah. And then I shot out again into the other side of the field. And this time I was observing, I had the thought, which was absolutely unusual at that point. I am not just my body. I am also a spirit. And there are two of me. And that other part of me is absolutely peaceful. And I came back into my body. And in some way, that represented the extension of the journey that I was already on to find out my purpose here and who I was. So that's how it started. Oh, I love that. And, you know, searching for our purpose. Yeah, I... Uh, I have to share, I was a preemie baby, two pounds, uh -huh. three pounds, uh -huh. not supposed to survive the night, but I did. And so for me, when I was a kid and my life was, I was meant to be here. Mm. What's my purpose? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be grateful for that. That's, that is so amazing, Steve, that. So after you had that experience of coming out of your body, have you had more of those in your lifetime? Yeah, so um, obviously after this experience, there's a part of adolescence 
or you try to forget it because you don't want to go to a mental institution. Yeah. Boys get very frightened about these things. And um, I had started, uh, med uh, there are a few things that happened, but I started meditating with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and people know who that is from the Beatles because they studied with him for a while. And so I began the TM technique and I wound up in my Orca Spain when I was 22. And I was meditating in my room and all of a sudden I felt this vibration in my body and the feeling was that I was becoming absorbed in my own being and then I shot out the top of my head and I was watching myself meditate from the ceiling. But then I shot through the ceiling into the cosmos. And I was going, I think at light speed, I saw planets, I saw, I saw, saw constellations, stars, and I was in a state of awe, thinking that I should be in fear, but it was all going so quickly, I couldn't be afraid. And I wound up at a barrier. And the barrier, in a, a kind of an intrapsychic way, I knew what it was. It was the barrier between life and death. And I had to make a decision about whether I wanted to come back to Earth or continue on. And before I made the decision, I had turned around. I suppose my unconscious made it. And as I was coming back, and it was before the Hubble, you, you have to imagine that when I saw the Earth, it was this glowing, gorgeous, precious sphere. And had I had a body, I would have weeped. But I didn't have eyes to cry, so I didn't cry but I felt it all inside. And then I saw Spain coming on the map <laughs> in terms of coming back to the country and then the hotel and I shot back into my body. And when I opened my eyes, I had never felt as fresh, as clear, as peaceful, as spiritual as I did in that moment. Oh. And I knew that this was the bridge between what I experienced at 12 and what I experienced then, because I knew then that I was an eternal being and that I was part, that my being was part of the cosmos and that I was here for a great purpose because I didn't decide to leave. Oh, I love that. I love that. And I, I would guess that that really changed your perspectives, you know, with being outside of what I call our physical vehicle, because really yeah. that's what it is. It's not our yeah. higher self. It's just the physical vehicle at this moment. Did that make a big change for you in how you viewed the, your lifetime? It made a huge change, Paul, because, um, when you know with certainty, it's not as if you've arrived because that experience diminishes over time. But you know with a certainty that's irrefutable that you are a spiritual being and that spiritual being is waiting for you to come back home. And that the rest of my life was a movement. Of course, we go through so many things in our lives, but during the points of clarity, my whole life became devoted to knowing that twin that I had, that twin that was free, that was fresh, that was like the spring breeze, that was eternal and spacious, and that I was drawn and motivated and almost hypnotized by it. And so my whole life became a movement toward that again. Yes. And you know, how powerful that you were given those experiences. Right? Oh my gosh. 
<laughs> and they said, oh, thank you. Wow, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, my gosh. Exactly. Well, please share with everyone a bit about your book. It's okay. So fascinating. So um, I've, I've had the great fortune of being with the shaman, which most people know his name, Don Miguel Ruiz. He wrote The Four Agreements, and he wrote the book of Power of Love and a few others. And I got to meet him before he was famous. I got to meet him when he was just walking around the street. <laughs> and at the time, my sister-in-law was dating him. Oh, my gosh. And one morning, she said, you know, I'm dating a shaman. How about if we have breakfast together? <laughs> so he came over for breakfast. And the odd thing about all that, was that four months before I met him, I had a lucid dream. And in this lucid dream, I was in, a, in a small adobe room somewhere in Mexico with three strangers. And we were sitting by candlelight. And this gorgeous shaman came in the room. And he was dressed in buckskin and he was from a different time and space. And he sat down in, in front of us and he made the wind, the wind blow through the room, this great gust of wind, but the candles didn't blow out. And then he started, he said, watch me. And he started shape shifting and there were two of him and then three of him. And I was so overwhelmed by this that I went up to him and I said, I want to know how you do this. And then he looked in my eyes with such a piercing stare. He took my hand and he said, this knowledge was as close to you as your beating heart. And I woke up. And so then I was in the car with Don Miguel going for breakfast in Malibu. <laughs> and I thought, I have a shaman sitting next to me. I'm going to ask him about this shaman dream. Oh, my God, I'm so lucky. So I told him about the dream, and he kept asking me about more details regarding the shaman. And I kept saying who he is, and Don Miguel said, you know. And I kept saying, no, I don't. <laughs> and I kept asking him. And finally, I kind of screamed at him and said, just tell me. <laughs> And he said, it's you. And you have an appointment with power. We're going to Mexico next week. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's how it started. And you went to Mexico the next week. My wife was in the back seat, and she gasped. We had a four-year-old daughter. And I said, yes. And she said, what are you doing? And I said, I think I'm going to Mexico. Yeah. So I got to Mexico and, you know, it's, there's so many stories in the book. The book was, and I'll tell you one of them, but the book was very easy to write because the experiences were so compelling that I had with him. Um, there, were, there was one thing that happened after another that was both a clarification and an extension of many of the experiences that we just talked about. So I'll give you one as a teaser for the book because it's, it's probably the most dramatic one. And I'll tell you part of it because it would go on for a while, but we were standing at the front of the palace of the Jaguar, just so your listeners understand Teotihuacan was the largest city in, in, um, in Mexico and in South America in the sixth century. It was the sixth largest city in the world. And it was populated by the Toltecs. And it was a very elaborate city. Just think of the Mayans, something like that. 
And so we were standing at the stairway that went down into the palace. And we walked down probably two flights of stairs. And we were in these dark hallways. And there was a room to my left. And Don Miguel put me in front of that room, which was pitch black. And he said, just stare into this room. And I stared into it for maybe five minutes. And I turned to him and I said, this is completely absurd. There's nothing in here. I'm going to go back upstairs. And he said, just keep looking. Within a minute, this light started spinning from somewhere deep inside this room. And it came toward me with an explosion. And it absolutely took me over. And my heart was filled with an onrushing flood of love that was so powerful that I fell on the floor weeping. And as I was on the floor, I realized that my hand was touching a foot. It was actually a sandal in this dark, cavernous room. And I was first frightened by it. But then as I looked up and saw the face, I realized that it was Jesus Christ. Oh. And he was putting his head, his hand on my head as I was standing there weeping and he took me to heaven. Oh, oh isn't that beautiful? Oh my gosh. I, I have, know I have tears just telling you right now. Yeah, that I'm tearing up. That's so beautiful. I, I just personally love shamanism. Uh, I've loved my shamanism training and the journeys and, and going beyond death, but not oh to experience that. Oh my gosh. Isn't that just <laughs> so amazing, Steve? There are, no, there are no words. It goes beyond all words, but I try to put it in words in the book. Yes. And a lot of the story is about the experience right after that. Oh. And what was it like seeing earth from heaven? Yeah. And then being with Christ again later in the day. Yeah. Uh, it, it was something else. Oh, I just can't even imagine how that made you feel. That is so beautiful. I, I know. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. And, you know, and now you can share so much with so many people because of your experiences, Steve. Yeah, thank you, Paula. And I'm so grateful you do. Oh, my gosh. Um, thank you. Yeah. And you, you know, the interesting thing is that um, this, all of this was quite private. I... I I was one of the people who brought Don Miguel out to the world in, in, in the beginning. And I set up conferences and I set up talks for him and little by little he got very famous. And I've been a very service oriented person and I wasn't thinking about bringing this information out. I was just doing my work and doing mindfulness workshops and relationship workshops. But then what happened is that about five years ago, five and a half, I got very, very ill. And I had something called Epstein-Barr virus, but I also had brain inflammation to the point that I was slurring my words. I couldn't think in the future. I couldn't intuit. I had a hard time walking. I had no energy and I went through this period of losing everything. I lost our home, lost my practice, and I was just living on the proceeds we had from selling our dream home. And I thought every day I would get up and I'm, I'm, I, I'm talking about this because I think it's important for people to know that illnesses have great meaning and that illnesses are initiations. And that I was initiated. I wasn't initiated immediately and it took many years. Every morning when I woke up, I would think I would pray, is this gone yet? Is this gone? I can't live anymore. 
I just had no energy whatsoever. So the thing that, many things, there were many medicines that got me better, but I think that the deepest medicine was learning to be self-compassionate. And that I had always been compassionate to others, to a fault. And I thought, I really did, that I was compassionate and self-loving with myself. But I had realized one day during the middle of the illness, when I was at my gravest point, that even though everything that was, was taken from me, there was one thing that was left. And what was left was that I was capable of love. Oh, yes. Touches me. Yes. And I thought, I can still love. I can love me. I can love others. Yes. And that was the big medicine with great, some really wonderful healers and art, which I discovered. That was the medicine that got me better. And so after I got better, I had, and it took a year or more after it was over to get better because I was so weak, to build my practice back. I had the strongest desire to go to a greater public and to talk about my experiences, what, which we're doing now, to help more people. Mm -hmm. So that's my mission now. Oh, Steve, please share with everyone your website, how they can learn more about you and your services. Okay. Sure, thank you. <laughs> so uh, my website is just like my name, Steve Hassenberg, H-A-S-E-N-B-E-R-G dot com. And on that website I have, and it's also on YouTube, I have a 17-part video series, which I did, called Secrets of the Universe, Walking the Conscious Path. So that's on there for everybody. It's free. That was one of my gifts to myself when I got better. And I have a spiritual psychotherapy practice in Santa Monica. I have a spiritual mentoring group that I do. And I have a lot of my radio and podcast shows online there if people want to listen. That is beautiful. With, with a few minutes left in the show, what last words do you want to share with everyone, Steve? Here's, the, you know, I, I carry this around with me. I, I'm an a ardent Sufi supporter. I love Rumi and I love Hafez. And I have a Rumi band. It's called the Rumi Project. And we play Rumi poetry and music. And so there's something that Rumi's teacher said to him that has been in my heart for probably 20 years. And I want to share it with everybody because I think it sums up my life and it sums up life in a perfect way. And his teacher was named Shams, which means the sun. So Shams said, a Sufi is thankful for all that is given, but a Sufi is also thankful for all that has been denied. So we become thankful for everything, knowing what's difficult, what is challenging is an initiation into a larger iteration of ourselves. What is good and happy we take and we bring into our hearts, but we don't turn from what's difficult because the difficult parts of my life have allowed me to be where I am now. And I am so very grateful. Yeah. Thanks those difficult parts of our life. I, I love that in initiation because they do, they open us up to a lot more and even appreciation and gratitude for, for the good parts. And Absolutely. What, what happened when I was ill, I know we only have a minute, <laughs> what, was that, I was forced through this challenge, through this initiation, to draw on patience, 
resilience, compassion, and inner power that I never knew I had. And now it lives with me. Oh, that is so beautiful. My gosh. You have brought happy tears to me, Steve. That is oh, so I'm touching. so glad. Yeah, just a, a, such a great message for everyone. And oh my gosh, I just, so much they can do connecting with you through your website and all the things you offer and help. I mean, you're, you're, you're a gift to us. Just as everyone, you're a gift. Thank you, Paula. Wow. Yeah, Steve, what, what you're offering to so many is so beautiful. And I am just offered to, or honored to share you with everybody today. Thank you, Paul. And I thank you for your gift of sharing the beauty of life, the happiness of life, which is, I read in your book, the happiness that is everybody's birthright. Yes. It truly is. It truly is, Steve. Gosh, love, hugs, and blessings to you. Everybody out there, love, hugs, and blessings. I will chat with you next week. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. bye.